take out our King James Bible. Amen. And please turn with me tonight to the Gospel of John, chapter number 20. John's Gospel, chapter number 20. And uh, some of the men read this portion of scripture this morning. Uh, Brother John Leonard and Brother John Ken Hiker. I guess we were on that this morning. Didn't I know that? That's interesting. But today those men read the portion of scripture we're about to read this morning, but I don't care. We're going to read it again. And that, that's a good attitude here at Bible Baptist Temple. We like to hear the same thing over and over again and from the Bible. So. John chapter 20. And again, make sure your cell phone is turned off or on silent mode completely. That'd be greatly appreciated. Yes. We always like to keep the admonition of the first. Timothy 3.15, that we would know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Yeah. Cell phone turned off, stay in our seats, not be talking with our neighbor, Good. just give our complete total attention to the word of God. Yeah. John chapter 20, of course, this is a resurrection Sunday here in John chapter 20. In John chapter 19, Jesus was crucified, and died on the cross for our sins, shed his blood, he was buried. Yeah. But that's only two-thirds of the gospel. Yeah. And two-thirds of the gospel won't save anybody. We need all three parts. And he rose again from the dead. And we certainly find that here in John chapter 20. In the first uh, 18 verses, you find that story of Resurrection Sunday morning. But now beginning in verse 19, we're going to begin to read Resurrection Sunday evening. By the way, what is right now? Resurrection Sunday evening. That's why we have church tonight, because we're going after the, the model here in John chapter 20, verse 19, where they had church on that very first resurrection Sunday night. Amen. So we'll pick up our reading there in verse number 19. The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Amen. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Amen. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Amen. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door was being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Yeah. Interesting, Jesus preached the same message two Sundays in a row. <laughs> I like that. Then, verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Amen. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other times truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this powerful portion of Scripture we read this morning, and we read again tonight, and I will get an opportunity to preach from it. Lord, thank you, Lord, that we can have church here tonight, and thank you for the freedoms that we still have in our nation, that we can assemble together freely and worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the changed lives in this room tonight. Okay. People that want to be here. That's Lord, I, I praise you. I thank you for that. A lot of places they could be, Lord, but we want to be here. We want to worship you. We want to sing to you. We want to give to you, serve you, and hear preaching yes. about you. And so, Holy Spirit, again, as I pray, pray privately, Lord, please fill me with the power of your spirit as I preach. Use me in a mighty way to take the things I've studied. May it be a blessing for the folks that hear, Lord. I pray for a revived spirit among the Christians here tonight. Lord, that we would once again be excited about church, be excited about our faith, be excited about uh, the commission that you've given to us. Uh, yeah, remind us of truth from your word, even help folks maybe to learn something from your word here tonight. Too. Mm -hmm. And Lord, this is primarily a message for Christians tonight, but Lord, it could be somebody here tonight that is lost. 
or they're certainly in a good environment, or to just for the fact that they're around church things and around Christians, I pray that would even that would stir in them and help them to see that they're missing something in their life. That they need Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. It needs to be a personal relationship. This day is not about uh, candy and bunnies and baskets right. and, and all that, but it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Help them to see that. And so, Lord, please work in a special way in this service. Lord, give us just a good time here around the Word of God. We pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're here again in John chapter number 20, and there are several characters mentioned in these verses that I've read here. Of course, the character of all characters is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the prominent character here. And of course, you have the 11 disciples, and of course, I said 11. There are, of course, originally 12, but one of the disciples is now in hell. That kind of sounds weird to say that, but it's true. Of course, Judas Iscariot by now is unfortunately in hell. And so you have remaining just the 11 disciples. Eventually, in the book of Acts chapter 1, the disciples would replace him with Matthias. But for right now, they have just these 11 disciples. And they're gathered together in the upper room. However, you have Jesus, you have the disciples. But there's one man, one of the disciples that is mentioned here uh, prominently. It is pointed out to us, and of course, that that would be Thomas. Now, Thomas, uh, over the years, has gotten uh, a nickname. There is an adjective that people place in front of Thomas's name, and it seems like you cannot read this portion of scripture or hear preaching about him without this nickname and without that adjective placed in front of his name. And this is nothing to split a church over tonight. This is just introduction to the message here. I'm not preaching on this, but I do want to talk about it for a few minutes. I personally believe that's not quite fair, what we call it. And I want to explain why. First of all, what is the nickname? What do we call Thomas? Uh, see, everybody is like a chorus in unison. I feel sorry for the guy. He's up there in heaven right now. He is in heaven. He is in heaven tonight. I don't know how much people in heaven know what's going on down here on earth, but I sure hope that he doesn't know what's going on down here on earth in some degree, because every time people read the Bible, all they hear is, Down in Thomas. But imagine if you were him. You would hate to be known as that, wouldn't you? You would hate for that. So I, there is no doubt that he did have a problem with doubt. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about his doubt. But I do not believe it is fair to him to call him that unless we're going to call all of the disciples the same thing. And I want to yeah, explain why. Good. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And again, this is not the, the message here, but just by way of introduction, I want to kind of vindicate him a little bit or clear his name or at least take a little bit of pressure off of him. I, I believe we're not quite being fair to him. Right. First of all, the name Doubting Thomas is not in the Bible. Right. Good. That's probably the best place to start. Just because something's not in the Bible doesn't mean it's wrong to say or use. There are words that we use that are in the Bible that are good words, but down in Thomas, God never called them that. So that some preacher somewhere along the way came up with that, and it seems to be a bit repeated. And we need to be careful about these little cute phrases, these little nicknames that we give people. Sometimes they don't necessarily reflect Bible truth. And I want to show you tonight that if you're going to say down in Thomas, then you need to uh, expand it out a little further and apply it to all the disciples. Matthew 28, look at verse 16. We're going to go through all the Gospels here and, and show you this. Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Yeah. Now what are these next three words? Yeah. But some doubted. It doesn't say but Thomas doubted. It says some doubted. It wasn't just Thomas. It was some of the other disciples as well. So that's the account there in Matthew 28. Now go to Mark chapter 16 as we use our Bibles tonight. Amen. Mark chapter number 16. If you read the Bible, sometimes it puts an end to some of the little things that we like to repeat. Mark chapter number 16. We'll begin in verse number 9. Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. 
After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Mm -hmm. Afterward, he, now this is a fascinating verse, verse 14. Afterward, he, Jesus, appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them. That word upbraid means to reprove with severity. He upbraided them, he reproved them with severity with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So again, it doesn't say that he upbraided Thomas, it says he upbraided all of them, all 11 of them. So they were all guilty. Now Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24, beginning in verse number 8. It says, And they remembered his words, verse 9, and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven, the eleven, of course, the disciples, and to all the rest. Verse 10, It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. They're, so these women who get together and they tell the eleven disciples all about the resurrection. Verse 11, And their words, the words of the woman, seemed to them, the disciples, as idle tales, and they believed them not. Wow. These women come and tell the disciples, the eleven disciples of the resurrection, and it seemed to them as an idle tale, and they believed them not. And now back to our text, please, in John chapter number 20. Or we'll spend the rest of our time, John chapter 20. And you don't, have, you don't have to turn to it, but in John chapter 21, remember what happened even after Peter saw the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then he said, I go fishing. So even after seeing the resurrected Christ, he still had some doubts. And he still went off back into his secular job, so to speak. Think about... Many Bible characters. Think about John the Baptist, all the great works he did for the Lord, and then John the Baptist was thrown into prison, and he began to have some doubts about the Lord. And he sent some of his disciples to Jesus, and he said, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Mm -hmm. Even John the Baptist, the man that Jesus said was the greatest man born of woman, even he had his doubts. So many Bible characters had their doubts, and sometimes we get so uh, hard and we get so critical of some of these Bible characters, we need to stop and realize, guess what? If you or I were in their shoes, we probably would have done the same exact thing. Yeah. <laughs> we read, you know, about uh, Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden. Oh, how could you be so stupid to eat that fruit? Hey, we would have done the same thing. Yep. <laughs> Put yourself in any story, any situation in the Bible, we would have been doing the same exact thing. So sometimes we get a little too critical, a little too hard on these Bible characters. They were just human. We have to remember, we're just human as well. We were just like them. Amen. And also here in John chapter number 20, although Thomas did have some doubting problems here, I believe that even there, I think sometimes we might not, we might be a little too hard on that because Jesus came and showed the, the ten disciples when Thomas was absent. Jesus showed the disciples his hands and his side. They had the benefit of seeing that. And then they told Thomas, hey, we've seen the Lord. And so they come to Thomas and they say, hey, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, well, except I see the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. Basically what Thomas is saying is, well, I just want to see the same evidence that you've got to see. That's right. Why do we give the, the ten disciples, they have the benefit of seeing the grace of the Lord, why do we give Thomas that same benefit? Yeah. And so we call him doubting Thomas. I think we might be just a little too critical, a little too hard on them. So if you're going to say doubting Thomas, I guess that's fine, but really to expand it out, what you ought to say is doubting disciples. D.D. Uh, -E, because they all had the same problem. Now Thomas did have that doubting problem. However, there is a problem Thomas had here in John chapter 20 that I, that I think was a lot worse. And it's found in verse number 24. I don't believe Thomas's main problem was doubt. I believe Thomas's main problem yeah, yeah, yeah. is that he was absent. Preach that. Amen. 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 He was absent. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Yeah. Now, we do believe Jesus started the church. Yep. You can believe something else if you want, but we believe Jesus started yeah. the church. And so, 
and it goes, yeah, this is just 11 people, 11 disciples. You say that's not very large of a church. We're too enamored today with numbers. Yes. That's right. Yes. Especially in our independent, and we are independent Baptists, but in our independent Baptist movement, we are too taken with numbers. Ooh, they had 7,000 at their church. They had 9,000 saved and 10,000 baptized. Ooh, we get all enamored with numbers. There's a lot of places that call themselves churches that are large and have large attendances. But if the place is dead as a doornail, God's not doing anything there. It's a dead church. And there are a lot of smaller churches where God is doing a great money work. Now, I don't know if we're one of those, but if we're not, I want to be one of those. We're certainly a small church. We're never going to be the world's largest anything around here. But that doesn't matter. When we stand before the Lord, we can still hear as individuals and hopefully collectively as a church, we can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful church. That has nothing to do with the size of right. the church. Don't get too caught up with that. They had just 11 people, and yet look at they did in the book of Acts. It says they turned the world upside down. Amen. Turned the world upside down. So we believe Jesus started the church. We believe here again, this is just 11 disciples gathered together, but hey, they were gathered together. God's people were gathered together on that very first resurrection Sunday night. Yes. But somebody was not there. Yeah. Thomas was not there. Thomas was missing. He missed the gathering of the disciples. He missed church. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm preaching a message tonight that I've entitled, What You Miss When You Miss Church. Mm -hmm. What You Miss When You Miss Church. Now, before I get the man into the message, I'm going to give you the introduction part two. I have more introductions than I have the actual, actual points of the message here tonight. Sometimes it happens that way. Yeah. Now, sometimes, let me say, but before I get too much into the message, that sometimes missing church is necessary. Sometimes it just happens. I understand that for various reasons. Sometimes we all have to miss church for one reason or another. You know, sometimes you have to miss church because you are sick. Yes, yes. That happens. Mm -hmm. And notice I said you are sick. Yeah. I did not say you are afraid to get sick. Amen. Mm -hmm. I said you're sick. Yeah. There's, Good. we have to qualify that today. There's a big difference. That's right. Amen. A big difference. It used to be people would say, if you're sick, stay home. And guess what? I agree with that. Yeah. If you are sick, please stay home. Mm -hmm. It'll benefit a lot of people. First of all, it'll benefit all of us because we don't want to catch what you have. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it'll benefit you to get better, to get the rest that you need. Some people don't seem to understand the fact that you need to get a little bit of rest in order to feel better. Mm -hmm. Some people never take it. It's not a sin to take a day off. If you really are sick, take a day off, take a sick day, to get better. Some people relax and they're sick all the time because they never get the rest that they need. Hey, get the rest. So, so take a day off for your own sanity, for our sanity. If you're sick, stay home. If you're afraid to get sick, mm -hmm. come to church. Amen. Yeah, sure. The safest place in all the world to be is in the will of God. Amen. Yeah, Look right. at the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. Where were they safest? In the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Where was Daniel safest? In the den of lions. The lions were not hungry that night for some reason. <laughs> The safest place in all the world to be is in the will of God. Amen. The will of God is not on your couch. That's right. The will of God is here in the Lord's house here in church. Amen. If you're sick, stay home. But today, unfortunately, in this past year, it's become the government is telling you, the politicians are telling you, the governor is telling you, if you're afraid to get sick, Come on. stay home. Amen. I'm not saying be, don't be sensible. I'm not saying not to take precautions, but I'm right. saying... Some of the same people that won't come to church because of the yeah. virus are the same people that will go out to eat. That's right. They'll go to Walmart. Come on, preach. You're telling me you're telling me you're safer in Walmart with 500 people than 50 yeah. people in church. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. They'll go to Walmart. They'll go to the restaurant. They'll yeah. go to the doctor's office. They'll yeah. go to the dentist office. They'll go to the veterinarian's yeah. office when they're sick, yeah. dad, or sick yeah. dog, but they won't come to church. Hypocrisy. That's right. Yeah. Truth. So if you're afraid to get sick, stay home is what they're telling you. Now, hey, come to church. Amen. So if you really are sick, though, yes, yeah, stay home. And sometimes you have to miss church because you're sick, because you have some kind of medical issue going on. I certainly understand that. Mm -hmm. On January 26th of the year 2020, I, Jeffrey Podowski, had my perfect attendance at Bible Baptist Temple ruined. <laughs> because I was home recovering from my oral surgery. Yes. So... And, but otherwise, I would have been here. So I guess I, you, could, you could 
could still say I have perfect attendance, I guess, other than that, other than that day if you want. Can you believe our pastor, earlier this year, in the month of January, our pastor had the audacity to miss three Wednesdays and two Sundays. Can you believe that? Well, he wasn't on the golf course, I'll tell you. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Not in January, at least. Guess what? He really was sick. So we'll give him a pass for that. That's a legitimate excuse. If you really are sick, yeah, sometimes you got to stay home. you got some kind of medical procedure, certainly. Uh, an occasional work obligation. That's understandable. So we have people, I think these people here today that unfortunately could not be here today because they had to work, and we, we understand that it happens every now and then. Some people in a medical profession, people that are maybe uh, you know police officers, firefighters, paramedics, uh, that kind of thing, different shift kind of work. Sometimes you have to miss... Uh, there's something here that we understand that. Now, I would say if you have to miss church all the time, if your job keeps you from church all the time, then that's probably not a good thing. I would probably pray about something else. All the secular jobs that I've had since I've been saved, I always pray and ask the Lord to give me something where I could not uh, miss church, and the Lord always answered that prayer. Amen. So, you know, maybe pray about that. So, if you have to miss church all the time, that's not good. But every now and then, that's understandable. Sometimes family emergencies come up, and maybe, or maybe a car repair, you get a flat tire on the way to church. Things, things happen, certainly, where you miss church. We understand that. But you understand, I'm not talking about those kinds of things. I'm talking about when you're perfectly healthy, when you're not working, when there's no emergencies, nothing like that going on, when you can be here, mm -hmm. and you deliberately choose not to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's who I'm preaching to tonight. Good. When you miss church. And when you miss church, you miss a lot. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You miss just one Sunday, yeah. it feels like you miss a month. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You miss just one Sunday, you come back, it feels like everything's yeah. topsy-turvy, you got to update yourself on all the different prayer requests and everything that's going on. Have you ever tried to explain uh, how great a church service was to somebody that wasn't there? And you had a great church service, and somebody missed the service, and they come back the next week, and you try to, oh man, God, you should have been here last Sunday. Man, Pastor preached a great message. That's every Sunday. And Pastor, <laughs> Pastor preached this great message, and boy, the choir sang great, the, the congregational singing was great. Somebody came forward to get saved, and we had this prayer request answered. You, you try to explain that to somebody that wasn't there. It's just not the same. No, that's true. Yeah. Just explaining the church service, there's some things you just have to experience. When you miss church, you miss a lot. And so let's examine some of those things here in John chapter number 20. Number one, when you miss church, you miss the peace of God. The peace of God. Amen. Again, in verse number 19. Then the same day of evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. In verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. At the end of verse number 26, the next week, he comes back and he says, Peace be unto you. So when you miss church, number one, you miss the peace of God. The peace of God. I think you've noticed that there is no peace in the world. And we can certainly understand that because they can't have peace without the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we certainly can have the, the peace with God and we can have the peace of God. But again, let me tell you, you're not going to get the peace of God sitting at home. Amen. Not going to get the peace of God sitting at home. Some of these people that, can you, this is now 55 Sundays in a row wow. that some people have not been in the house of God. Wow. 55 Sundays in a row. And some of these people, I honestly don't think we'll see some people in their ch churches across the country, some people will probably just never come back. Right. They've gotten that scared. Yep. Why, do, why are they that scared? They don't have the peace of God. Why don't they have the peace of God? Because they're not here to get it. Good. Oh, sure, they can bring their Bible at home. I'm sure they are. They can watch a sermon on their computer and on the TV, and that's fine, but that's not the same thing as being in church to get the peace of God. Amen. If you are shut in, I know there are people that are shut in and sick, people laid up in the hospital bed. Yeah. Certainly, that's understandable. God can minister to them there. But again, I'm talking if you can be here. Right. 
Big difference there. You're not going to get the peace of God sitting at home out of the will of God. That's right. But there's something that God does here. That's right. A peace that God gives here that he doesn't give anywhere else. That's right. Just walking into this building. Mm -hmm. I know the church is not the building, but there is something about just being in this place. That's right. There's something about being here. One thing I love to do is to watch people walk into the building. Yeah. I, I don't get out much. I don't have a very exciting life, so I guess I just like that. <laughs> Keeps me out of trouble, I'll tell you that. <laughs> But I like, I get here early, I'm usually one of the first people here, and so I like to watch people walk into the building, whether it be walking into the kitchen doors, or walking through the double doors, or I'm in the auditorium, and I see people walking in here, especially on Wednesday night when people have been at work all day, or people have been out in the world, and people walk into the church building, and you can almost see a relief on their face. It's like, oh, out of the world, finally, I'm in church. It's like, all day long, I've been looking forward to getting here. And finally, I'm here. Praise yeah. God. You can see the relief on their face. You can see the peace that they have just being here. Yeah. That's the peace of God. When you miss church, you miss the peace of God. That's right. The peace of God is a uniting peace. Mm -hmm. In Romans 5 and verse number 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Savior, what? through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. But a united peace. You know, we are at enmity with God before we're saved. We're enemies of God, but when we get saved, we have that peace of God, we're justified by faith, and then we're united again with the Lord. So it's a united peace. It's an unexplainable peace. Yeah, right. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's an unexplainable peace. Try to explain the peace of God to an unsaved person. They can't do it. They can't understand us. They cannot understand why we enjoy coming to church so much. They can't understand why we're not afraid to be out in public during this past year. Amen. Aren't you afraid of COVID? Yeah. Oh. Reach. Reach. You're afraid. Oh, you're afraid. Oh. I can't speak for everybody here, but honestly, no. I'm not afraid. Praise the Lord. First of all, if God wants me dead, I'm going to be dead. That's right. There's not much I can do about it. There's no doctor in the world or no medicine in the world that can save me if That's God right. wants me in heaven. That's right. Amen. Second of all, heaven would be a lot better than being here. As much as I love this church, as much as I enjoy my life, heaven sounds pretty sweet to me right now. So you're going to threaten me with heaven? I don't think so. And us as you know, lost people just don't understand us. You're not afraid of, of getting COVID and dying? No. I don't want to, but I'm not afraid of it. If God allows it to happen, then it happens. But hey, I, I, again, I can't speak for anybody else, but I'd rather come to church and catch COVID and die than to stay on the couch out of church for 55 Sundays in a row. That's just me. I can't speak for everybody. I'm not speaking on behalf of our church. I'm speaking on behalf of me. But hearing a lot of the amens, I think many of you agree. Yeah. It's an unexplainable piece. The lost world does not understand how we can go through this tossing, uh, tossing turvy life, all the turmoil that's going on, all the storms of life, and how we have this peace. Yeah. It's can't explain it. It's a, it's a united peace. It's an unexplainable peace. It's an unequal peace. Right. Good. Isaiah 26.3, that will keep them in perfect peace. Whose mind has stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. It's an unequal peace. There's, no, there's a perfect peace. It's nothing that anything the world has to offer. No, no other peace in the world can equal the peace that God can give us. And when you miss church, you miss the peace of God. Just look at the people out in the world. Yeah. Just look at them out in the world. They have no peace. They're all scared to death over everything that's going on. No peace whatsoever, but we, as God's people, we get peace. And there's, again, a lot of these professing Christians that have not been in church in over a year now. That's right. And they don't have peace either. Nope. Yeah. They don't have it either because they're not here where the source of peace is. Amen. That's good. That's good. When you miss church, you miss, number one, the peace of God. Mm -hmm. Number two, you miss the praise of God. Yeah. Good. And that's found in verse number 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples 
glad when they saw the Lord. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Gladness, joy, praise, rejoicing, all those things go hand in hand together. Pastor I preached a lot about this topic uh, this morning, and so this will shave a few minutes off the message, thankfully. Just go back and listen to this morning's message if you want more on this, but I'll repeat a few of the things because I like to preach it too. <laughs> but again, the praise of God. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, and they began to praise the Lord. There's, there's something about this, what we call corporate worship, where we're all together. Congregational worship. Now, we can praise God on our own when we're in our homes, and we should. We can read the Bible at home by ourselves, and we should. You can sing songs to the Lord throughout the week, and you should. But there's something when all of God's people are together doing it. There's this synergy that is together. We're all of God's people. We're all collected together doing it. You know, I cannot participate in congregational singing at home by myself. That's right. Now, I sing hymns at home by myself, but that's not congregational singing. That's just him singing by myself. It's not congregational singing. In order to participate in congregational singing, you have to be in the congregation. Oh, that's... I, I graduated high school, and I, I learned that. Wow. You have to be in the congregation to sing congregational singing. What a novel idea. So you can do all these things alone, but there's something about when you do it together... Again, Psalm 34, verse 3, as Pastor quoted this morning, will magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I quote this verse often when I lead in public prayer, but Psalm 133, verse number 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity. Unity around the word of God. Of course, there's a false unity. There's a unity that the world is trying to do. I'm not talking about that unity with the United Nations and the one world government that's quickly... Uh, forming around, I'm not talking about that kind of unity, but I'm talking about a unity around truth, a unity yeah. around the Word of God, a unity yeah. around the, the gospel. Psalm 149, verse number 1, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. So there it is again, this, this collective praise, this collective worship. Again, I do believe you should praise God when you're out there driving your car. That's right. Nothing wrong with driving down the road and singing some songs. Yeah. You know, maybe get yourself some good Christian music CDs. That's what I did when I started driving. I made myself some Christian music CDs and put those in the car. I'm always listening to music when I'm out driving around on the 25-minute ride to and from church. I'm listening to music often. I listen to music a lot at home when I'm just doing things around the house, ironing my church clothes, getting those things ready, I'm listening to good Christian music. Not contemporary trash, That's right. not rock music, but good old-fashioned hymns of the faith and such, and some of our good music that we sing here. So I'm always listening to music and singing music and getting ready for the congregational songs of the week. That's good. I do all that by myself. You should do that too. That's not a replacement for what we do here. Yes, that's right. You need to have that unified a congregational time together. We praise God together through our singing. We praise God together with our with our prayer requests. You know, yes. with our answered prayers. Well, it's an yes. exciting thing yeah. uh, to hear answered prayer, is it not? Amen. Amen. And we, so we join ourselves. We, we hear about an answer to prayer, and we can praise God together. We glory to God together over those answered prayers and over the needs that God meets around here. It's just that we, we, we miss the praise of God, though, when you're not in church. That's right. People that have not been in church for 55 Sundays in a row now, they have missed out on the praise of God. That's right. Oh, they might hear about an answered prayer, you know, on, you know, through a text message, or they might get a phone call and find out what's going on, or they might read a newsletter or a bulletin, or they might hear a radio broadcast, and that's all well and good and fine, but they're missing out on the collective, unified praise of God that we get here in the house of the Lord. Amen. When you miss church, you miss the peace of God. You miss the praise of God. Number three, you miss the plan of God. Good. The plan of God. Good. Look at verse number 21. Mm -hmm. Verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Here's the plan. Mm -hmm. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Good. Of course, the Father sent the Lord Jesus Christ into this world to die on the cross, shed his blood for our sins, be buried, rise again the third day. 
And even as the Father sent Jesus into the world, now Jesus is sending the disciples out into the world. That's right. Not to die on a cross, but rather to preach the gospel that Jesus came to provide. As my Father had sent me, even so, send I you. That's the plan of God. When you miss church, you miss out on the plan of God, this great commission, as we call it. The Great Commission was given to churches. Yeah. The Great Commission was not given to individuals. Amen. Again, individual people make up churches, but the Great Commission was given to churches. Not just, there's not just one person that can fulfill the Great Commission. Yeah. Not just one church can fulfill the Great Commission. Yeah. It's all doing their part, working together. If you want to be involved in the plan of God, you need to be a part of a Bible-believing yeah. church. Good. Amen. Amen. God does not work through what I call these Lone Ranger Christians. Amen. There's a lot of these ministries today, these, these men out there, even some women, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'll stick with men for now. But there are these men out there, and yeah, I'm sure some of them may be saved, they may be sincere, or dedicated, godly, but, but they're just out there by themselves. They're not part of any one particular church. They go out and they do track to pass it out and they street preach and that's all well good and fine and they, they have their little ministry, their little thing, but if you ask them, you know, what church are you a member of? Yeah. What church do you go to? What church are you sent out of? And they have no answer. Yeah. They're not part of a church. They're not part of a ministry. They're just out there by themselves. God does not work like that. Nope. God does not bless like that. I'm not saying that God can't use somebody like that in a limited way. Anytime the gospel gets out, God can use the gospel, yes, but if you want to be a part of the plan of God and have God's fullest, richest blessings upon you, you need to be a part of a Bible-believing yes. church. Yes. You know, our pastor every week probably gets phone calls and letters and emails about uh, missionaries that are looking for support. Yes. Yes. And in, in one sense, it's a good thing, we're glad that there's missionaries that are, that are wanting to do that. But also, of course, we can't support everybody. And so because we can't support everybody, there are certain standards that our missionaries have to meet if we're going to even consider them coming to our church to, to give their uh, presentation. First of all, you know, one of the things we'll ask them is, you know, what church do you go to? What church are you a part of? That's one of the questions we'll have to ask them. And if they say, well, I'm not really a part of church, I'm just, well, then we have to hang up on them, but we essentially say, well, sorry, no. <laughs> You know, we want, we want to hear that they're a part of a church. We want to hear a part that they're a part of a Baptist church. Yeah. We want to know that they're a part of a fundamental Baptist church. Yes. A fundamental and only independent Baptist church. Yeah. A fundamental independent King James only Baptist yeah. church. Yeah. A fundamental independent King James only non-charismatic, non-Calvinistic, yeah. non-contemporary Baptist church. Yeah. Yeah. You say, boy, it's, it's, you're pretty, you're pretty narrow-minded there. I'm about as narrow as this King James Bible. It's about how narrow I am, yes. Yeah. So, we, we, God does not work through these lone range of Christians. God does not work through boards. Yeah. You know, here in some of these churches, the deacon board. No deacon boards. <laughs> committees and organizations and meetings. Some, some churches have to have a meeting about everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, a light bulb went out in the hallway. We need that. Let's have a business meeting to talk about changing that light bulb. Okay, let's, let's have this meeting. Who's going to hold the ladder? And who's going to climb on the ladder? What brand of light bulb are we going to get? And uh, what store are we going to buy it from? If you need to pray about this for two weeks, just change the light bulb. Yeah. Y'all need a business meeting about every little thing like that. Some things just need to get done. God doesn't work through boards and meetings and committees and these denominations and home ranges. God works through churches. Amen. That's how God works. And so if you want to be part of a plan of God, you need to be a part of a church. Amen. And Thomas was not there that night, so he missed out on this plan of God. Yes. The church is so vitally important. I don't believe we can exalt uh, the church too highly when you consider, first of all, the price of the church. Good. The price of the church. Ephesians 5.25, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28, just an unbelievable verse in my mind. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you over his ears, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Yes. What a high price. Yes. Yes. Blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the price of the church there in Acts 20, 28. Amen. And when you consider that Christ gave his blood 
for the church when we consider that Christ gave his life for the church? Should you not at least be willing to attend it? Amen. Yeah. Yeah, Let alone join it yes. and serve it yes. and be faithful and be a part of it when you consider the price of the church? Jesus Christ did not die on the cross and shed his blood for you to sit on the couch. That's right. He died for the church, the price of the church. Think about the purpose of the church. Mm -hmm. Go with me to Acts chapter number 2, please. Acts chapter 2, we look at these verses often. This is the day of Pentecost, where the church did not start, but rather the church was empowered on Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came, Acts chapter number 2. We think about the purpose of the church, and this is always something that is good to remind ourselves of, because so many people have a wrong idea of what churches are for. Mm -hmm. You know, we... I've been reading that uh, the Euclid Observer newspaper that we have, and there are certain churches, if you want to call them churches, places that call themselves churches in the community, and they'll write their column, and they'll talk about the things that are happening in their church this yeah. month. Well, we served the meal to this group, and we got a new refrigerator for our kitchen. And we did. That's not what the church is about. Yeah, right. We got a refrigerator, too. Are we going to write an article for the newspaper about it? We got a water cooler. Let's write, a, let's write an article about a water cooler in the foyer. But that's not the purpose of the church. We have meals here every now and then. If you can help out the poor, help out the community, that's fine. But that's not what a church is about. The church is not about feeding the, the, the you know, hungry and clothing the naked and helping out the poor and then doing all that. If you want to know what the church is about, read Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. And they that gladly received his word. I've never met anyone that sadly received his word. <laughs> they that gladly received his word were <coughs> baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued, I like that, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Mm -hmm. That's a dirty word in some churches today, but the apostles' doctrine, the teaching of the word of God, and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The purpose of the church, we see salvation here, we see baptism here, we see church membership here, we see discipleship here, we see doctrine here, we see fellowship, we see prayers, we see edification, we see praise, we see so many things here. Not getting new refrigerators, not serving a meal to the community. That's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church here in the book of Acts is evangelism and discipleship and, and building each other up in the faith and being there for one, one another in the fellowship, singing us apart, praising God. Hey, read the book of Acts and you'll find the purpose of the church. Yeah, good. The purpose of the church. The price of the church, the purpose of the church, the purity of the church. Ephesians 5, 27 talks about a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. We sing that, we sing that song sometimes, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. In 594, we talk about the purity of the church. You know, when Jesus comes again and comes to take his, his, his Christians out of here, his saints out of here, his church is out of here, when Christ comes again, he doesn't want to find a, a bride that's uh, bickering and arguing one with another and bitter at each other and, and filled with fleshly sins of the world. He wants to find a unified church, a purified church, holy, without spot, without blemish. Yeah. So we need, if the church is going to be pure, then the individuals in the church need to look pure. Right. And so it's, uh, it, you know, sometimes people complain about churches. Oh man, this church uh, isn't doing this and this church isn't doing that. Some people love to complain about what a church isn't doing, but they don't do anything to help out themselves. Right. If you yeah. see something missing in this church, hey, roll up your sleeves and get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Do something about it. Yeah. Do something about it. They, they, the church is only going to be as strong as all of us working together. Yeah. And so we need to consider the purity of the church, living our holy lives before the Lord. But think, again, think about the plan of God. When you miss church, you miss the plan of God. Yes, sir. The plan of God. If you want to be involved in the work of God, you need to roll up your sleeves and get involved in church. When you miss church, you miss the peace of God, the praise of God, the plan of God, and number four, you miss the power of God. Good. Good. 
with the power of God. There in John chapter 20 and verse number 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Of course, that's a picture of the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of God, of course, is where we get our power. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Yes. Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 6. It's the Holy Spirit of God that gives us the power. When you miss church, you miss the power of God. Yes. Acts chapter number 4, if you're still close by there, Acts chapter number 4, power of God. Boy, there's so many Christians today, so-called Christians today, just going through the motions. Going through the motions, just, yep. it's, it's, it talks about their revelation. They're not hot, they're not cold, they're lukewarm. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I don't, I don't like lukewarm food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> there's a lot of foods that are good, hot, and cold. You know, pizza, hot pizza, cold pizza. Yeah. Not a lot of people eat lukewarm pizza where it's been sitting out for several hours and it's got mold going on and the flies are attracted to it. <laughs> fried chicken. Now we're getting spiritual here. <laughs> fried chicken. Hot fried chicken. Cold fried chicken. That's yeah. good. Amen. I don't want a lukewarm just sitting out. Yeah. Think about coffee and tea. There's hot coffee and there's iced coffee. There's hot tea and there's iced tea. I've never been to a restaurant that served lukewarm tea. At least maybe it was when I gave it to you, but it didn't save that on the menu. <laughs> lukewarm is not something that's appealing to our taste buds, and it's not appealing to the Lord Jesus Christ either when it comes to Christians in his churches. Yeah. But we have so many Christians that are lukewarm today, going through the motions. They don't have the power of God. That's right. They're just content with what they've done in the past. Talk to some Christians. Well, I used to do I used to teach a class. I used to pass out tracts. I used to witness, I used to sing in the choir, I used to do this. I, why aren't you doing it anymore? Yeah. What happened? I used to, I'm used to Christians. They don't have the power of God upon them anymore. But the Holy Spirit of God will give us, first of all, power to witness. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 29. Verse 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. This is the, the disciples praying here. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Okay. Well, the world is certainly bold in what they believe, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. They're bold in what they do. Hey, we need some boldness, but you're not going to get that boldness through any fleshly means it's going to come only through the Holy Spirit of God. It gives you that power to witness. A power to worship. Power to worship. In John chapter 4, verse number 24, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. He said, God is a spirit, and they have worshipped him, but worship him in spirit and in truth. A lot of people are going about our churches today going off the rails when it comes to worship. To them, worship is having, you know, the drum set up there and, and having the swirling lights and everything. That's that's their idea of worship. And they dress down, they dress casual, and they sing the, the rock songs and the contemporary songs, and they dance around and sway their wave their arms and sway their body around. They think that's worship. You can worship God without music. That's right. Uh, yes, sir. I enjoy music. I thank God for music. I love music. I don't want to get rid of music in our church, but you can worship God without Music and the, the, the right kind of music can aid in your worship, but the wrong kind of music will hinder your worship. Yeah, that's right. The wrong kind of music will hinder your worship. But we need to worship God in spirit and in truth. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. You're worshiping by the event again around the truth of the Word of God and the power to worship Him correctly. Power to witness. Power to worship. Power to walk. In Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Again, the Christian life so many times is referred to as walking. We're just walking. When you walk, you just take one step in front of the other, and you make constant progress. And that's what the Christian life is. Just put one step in front of the other, spiritually speaking, you're making progress, moving toward the Lord and toward His will for your life. The power to walk. 
Boy, we need the power of God, and we need the Holy Ghost of God upon us. But when you miss church, you miss that power of God. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you can be in church, and you deliberately choose not to be, you miss the power of God. You're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit right. sitting on your couch when you could be here. Amen. When you could be here. There in John chapter 20, yeah, Thomas had some doubting issues. No doubt about it. No doubt about the doubt, as I said earlier. But all the disciples had that problem. The doubting disciples. But Thomas' biggest problem, I don't believe, was his doubt. Because later on, mm -hmm. in chapter 20, verse 28, he actually gives one of the greatest confessions of faith in the entire Word of God. Yes. He said, my Lord and my God. Amen. What a great, powerful confession of faith that is. We ought to remember him for that. Yes. <laughs> Not for his doubt. What a great, what a great confession of faith. But he did have a problem in this chapter, his absence. That's right. Yeah. He wasn't in church right, right. when he should have been, when he could have been. And I don't know where he was. The Bible doesn't say. We don't need to speculate, but he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. He wasn't there. And he missed a lot when he wasn't there. He missed the peace of God. Yep. He missed the praise of God. Yep. He missed the plan of God. He missed the power of God. And guess what? 2,000 years later on this Resurrection Sunday night, you and I will miss the same exact things when we miss church. That's right. When you can be here and you choose not to be here, you miss a whole lot. It's sad today that you have to beg supposed Christians to come to church. Amen. But I got saved, say nobody had to beg me to come to church. That's right. Even times when I was backslidden and cold to the things of God years ago, I was still faithful to church. I still knew that's where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that God does here, He's not doing out there. He's not what He does here. He doesn't do in the bar. He doesn't do in the ballpark. He doesn't do in the ballroom. Right. But He does it in a Baptist church. What do you miss when you miss church? Let's stand together and pray. Father, thank you for this night for the opportunity to be in church. Lord, thank you for the people here tonight that wanted to be here. Yep. Lord, I thank you for the desire that I have to be in church. Lord, that's a, for anybody here that wants to be here tonight, that's a good sign of, of salvation. Yep. It's a good assurance of salvation the Holy Spirit gives that you want to be around other people that believe the same thing you do. Mm -hmm. So Lord, thank you for that assurance of salvation, of uh, just the fact that we want to be here tonight. Thank you for a good, faithful, core group of people here in our church, Lord. We praise you for that. We pray that we continue and that you would even add to our ranks, Lord. Yes. Even add to our numbers, Lord. Again, we're not out to build a large church, but we do want more people to join in with us, Lord. We're on the greatest journey imaginable. Serving you, Lord, here in this wonderful place. And so we do pray that you can lead other people here, Lord, and, and, and convict people about that. That, that necessary thing, even a church membership, baptism, or that sort of thing, Lord, please continue to direct and guide in our church. And Lord, help us, Lord. Again, there are times where maybe we do have to miss for one reason or another. But Lord, when we can be here, I pray that you can give us that want to, give us that desire to always want to be here. Lord, please work in this invitation time, Lord. I don't know how you've spoken to hearts tonight, and I pray as folks come and pray and, and talk with you about things, Lord, I pray that you would make this a special holy time, Lord. And just thank you so much that we could be here tonight as we wrap up this wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Yes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.